and I'm the D Deputy Director for the Division of Child and Family Wellbeing um, at the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. We um, in North Carolina have a mega agency, so a number of our health and human services at the state level are uh, all in one agency, which makes uh, doing work like this a little bit easier. Um, definitely still with its uh, its own challenges that we'll talk about. Um, but in my role as the deputy director of this division, I oversee three major nutrition programs at the department, SNAP, WIC, and the Child and Adult Care Food Program. Um, we work very closely with Medicaid, though that's a different division in our department. Laurel, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Mandu. Hi, everyone. My name is Laurel Ewan, and I'm a project analyst with NCDHHS um, with the data office team. So I've been with DHHS since COVID, the start of COVID, and um, with how it relates to this project on cross-enrollment. I've been working on the more on the data tech side um, and helping to lead this, and we've been working on this for the past year, past year and a half, I guess now. So really looking forward to sharing what we've done and some lessons we've learned through it. Great. So um, on the next side, slide, I'll, I'll set the stage a little bit around why, why we embarked on this work in the first place. So um, one of our secretary's top priorities is child and family well-being, uh, in addition to behavioral health resilience and um, a strong and inclusive workforce. And within child and family well-being, addressing nutrition security and food security is, is a really key goal. We know that um, when families and children have access to healthy food in a consistent manner, um, we know that they're setting up to thrive and do well in school um, later in life. In our state, um, probably similar to much of the country, about 11% of our population is experiencing food insecurity. Close to 400,000 of those individuals are children. And so um, this is really critical, especially as we know grocery store uh, costs are still at, food inflation is still at quite a high. Families are still facing challenges, putting food on the table. Um, and so um, making programs like SNAP, WIC, and um, uh, other supports available is really paramount. It's, a, it's an evidence-based tool um, to address some of the needs that our families are facing and, and really, which we know are foundational to health. So on the next slide, um, even though we know programs like Medicaid and in North Carolina, we, we call SNAP, FNS, Food and Nutrition Services, um, and the WIC program, again, are all evidence-based programs that we know help lift families out of poverty and improve health and address nutritional needs. We also know we have not been reaching all those that are eligible uh, and have some work to do. Though during the pandemic, we actually saw great increases across all three of these programs. Um, in North Carolina, I'm really proud to say had the, one of the largest increases in WIC participation in the country. Um, and so we, we, we know that this picture changed a bit during COVID, but that there are still folks that we, um, you know, could be doing a better job of reaching um, with, with benefits like Medicaid, SNAP, and WIC. Um, so on the next slide, um, we, about a year and a half ago, we embarked on a, a journey um, with Benefits Data Trust. They are um, a national nonprofit that's really focused on streamlining eligibility and enrollment and um, ensuring dignified access to benefits. And we were selected as a state um, to focus on an, a, a longer term effort to really increase SNAP and WIC enrollment, which was very aligned with our uh, departmental strategic plan for the past couple of years. And so that opportunity provided some focused funding and technical assistance for us to be able to hire a dedicated project manager to really help us with this work. Because we know new work at the state level requires new capacity because all of our staff are already stretched just doing the day-to-day, -day, which is a tall order as we are in a world of federal waiver and unwinding from the PHE. So the new capacity um, from BDT was really immensely helpful for us to get started on this work. And we really think about 
what we've been doing here in the cross enrollment space is a three pronged strategy. First, we started with data matching and analysis and Laurel's gonna do a deeper dive into that and what that work really entailed and what, what it has set us up to be able to do. I will wrap up with a little bit of, once we did match data across SNAP, WIC and Medicaid to figure out who was eligible but not enrolled, um, how did we use that data to be actionable and to do some tailored outreach to folks who might be enrolled in one of those programs and likely eligible for another, but not enrolled. Um, and so I'll touch briefly on a pilot that we've um, we've finished up um, to try to increase WIC enrollment. And then the last prong is really something we've tried, we've been trying to do all along the way is um, implement systems changes short and long-term to make it easier for families to access programs like SNAP and WIC. Um, we were very fortunate um, to, to use our ARPA money on some systems changes that we hope will make our SNAP benefits, for example, more accessible online or um, getting grants to test out um, telewic models. So that's been a focus for us kind of all along. So with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Laurel to dive a little bit into the specifics of how we began the data matching process. All right, thanks, Madhu. So one of the first steps in our journey was making sure we had the necessary data sharing agreements in place. So we engaged legal very early on and identified that we needed to uh, execute a new data use agreement for this cross enrollment project because we were looking at sharing three different data sets. So SNAP, Medicaid, and WIC, which were across two divisions. Um, we have our WIC and our SNAP data in our division of child and family well-being, and then our Medicaid data was with our is with our division of health benefits. So in parallel to this, we also identified what are our project design requirements. Um, and we did this together with the business because we know we needed to get really crisp on what data we were trying to um, share. Why do we need to share this? How are we gonna share it? Who would need access? All of these kinds of questions because um, the law is the gatekeeper for everything as well. So um, we got really into the details of this also up into like for outreach, what was our plan for outreach? Are we doing it at an individual level, household level? Are we going to do SMS messages or mailers? Um, things like this. So some of the some of these things we knew, others required some digging and some researching. Um, but all that to say, we were able to execute the DUA in three weeks, which is very fast, especially for um, DH NC DHHS. And reflecting back on this, we had several things that worked to our advantage that helped us to succeed in coming to um, executing the agreement on a timely basis. So one was definitely having that strong backing from leadership, um, from the division directors, as well as from our secretary, he made it very clear that this was one of his top priorities. So that that helped immensely in really pushing this forward. Um, another thing is that we had a very strong and engaged team. And we had one person in the beginning to really convene all the required stakeholders to push this um, DUA through. So we got together the lawyers from the different divisions, the different data owners across divisions, business folks, technical folks, et cetera to make sure that we were really on the same page. Um, and that really helped to reduce a lot of the email traffic, which can delay things. Um, and and um, yeah, that that really helped to expedite things. And another thing that I, that reflecting back helped a lot was that we identified early on that a bottleneck would be legal because they're, they're often slammed with a lot of agreements that they're working on. So we also helped to pre-draft that language in the DUA. So all legal had to do was really review it. Um, and then another thing I would add is that our data office governance team had created a data request form. And this was a very well thought out tool that had been vetted by legal before as well. And this is used to capture all the requirements for a data request. So this outlines like, what are all the data elements you need? Why do you need them? How are they gonna be shared? To whom are they gonna be shared? So being able to outline all of this on one form helped us to be prepared when we also met with legal to make sure that 
um, we would get all their questions answered up front. So that, that definitely contributed to a lot of time savings. In terms of our scope, um, this diagram visualizes uh, what our overall, overall long-term goal is. So as Madhu was talking about, we're really trying to increase enrollment um, in WIC and SNAP for those who are eligible across, across the state. Um, and right now where we're at is that smaller circle, that gray circle, um, this represents our current enrollment in WIC and SNAP. And the middle circle, this represents our, our short to midterm goal, which is to increase enrollment into our main food and nutrition program, SNAP and WIC, from the people that we know of already. So focusing primarily on those three programs, WIC, SNAP, and Medicaid. So for example, who from Medicaid is likely eligible for SNAP and or WIC, but is not yet enrolled. So that's our main focus right now with our cross enrollment project. Um, so before we embarked on the data matching, another one of our initial steps was really getting clear on the business questions that we were trying to answer. Um, so for example, uh, if we take the scenario of we're trying to grow WIC enrollment, we would ask the questions such as, how many SNAP and or Medicaid folks are likely eligible for WIC? And of those, how many are enrolled, not enrolled, but who are eligible? And what are the enrollment rates by demographics as well? So we can see if there are any trends and patterns of, of cross enrollment, better cross enrollment rates across different demographic groups that could help with prioritizing our outreach. So after defining these key business questions that really framed our project, um, on a high level, the next step was understanding what were the eligibility requirements for each of these programs. So we captured and documented these in an eligibility matrix, which consists of two main parts. This first part is outlining the eligibility rules for each of the respective programs. And this view here on screen, this shows the high, very high level eligibility rules of each of the three, three programs side by side here. So as you can see, um, there are differences across all the three programs, which makes it very challenging to estimate someone's eligibility for a program. The only eligibility um, requirement that's the same across all three programs is uh, residency, North Carolina residency. Other than that, there are differences across the three. So the second part of the matrix, um, this one, <laughs> Don't get overwhelmed by this, but this one is more in terms of covering each scenario for assessing likely eligibility for a program. Um, so for example, the first column, I know we just zoomed out on this eligibility matrix just to give you a sense of how much work went into really understanding the eligibility rules and how it relates to trying to identify people who are likely eligible for a program. So this first column, these are the different scenarios. So for example, it could say, who from FNS is likely eligible for WIC, or who from WIC is likely eligible for FNS, et cetera. It goes through all the different combinations. And then we, across the different columns, we have each of the eligibility requirements. So we have citizenship, residency, income, uh, resources, um, et cetera. And we assess each scenario against those requirements based on three main factors, whether the data is available, whether that data is reliable, and the impact of that data on assessing someone's likely eligibility. So for example, if we're trying to assess um, someone from WIC and whether they're likely eligible for FNS, we would look at the uh, what data is available from WIC, from WIC to assess whether this person will meet FNS eligibility requirements. We know that FNS requires US citizenship, for example. WIC does not require US citizenship and therefore we don't have any data on that to assess that. So we would mark that in the matrix as like, we don't have any data on that, so we can't assess that. And that would be um, at the end, very end of this spreadsheet, which is cut off. This also um, kind of analyzes the overall assessment of um, this scenario. So for example, with that um, citizenship requirement, this would be, this would go under a false positive, um, which, Maybe, maybe persons that may be incorrectly identified as potentially eligible because we don't know their citizen citizenship status. So this is this gives you a sense of uh, the how complicated this work was um, and 
And we spent a lot of time with this, with our business teams to really get this right, because this served as the bedrock for developing all of our um, cross-enrollment data transformation logic, because we built an automated solution to assess uh, folks' likely eligibility for each of the programs. Um, so yeah, as you can tell, eligibility is complicated. And one thing that we always try to make clear is that eligibility, what we're estimating, they're all estimates, right? Um, we're not an eligibility determination system. These are estimates based on the data that we have available. And one of the main challenges I'd like to highlight that stems from, for estimating likely eligibility, um, really stems from the differences in data that we have across programs, especially when it comes to household size, household income, and also demographics. So for example, if we have someone that's enrolled in Medicaid and WIC, they may be um, reported as, like say her name is um, Samantha. Samantha may be reported in Medicaid as Black African American, but in WIC reported as Caucasian. So how do we reconcile these differences? So we had to really think through all these different types of scenarios to reconcile these data and set rules to be able to create some kind of hierarchy. So if this situation, which which data point would we um, use over the other? So that's just a taste of some of that. I did want to highlight one example of um, a challenge that um, a big challenge that we had when when assessing likely eligibility. So for household size. So all three programs define household differently. So WIC, on a very, very high level, WIC defines household based on individuals who are living together, whereas Medicaid defines it based on who files taxes together and for FNS, based on who eats together in a household uh, living on under the same roof. So this, as you can tell, will make it uh, challenging to estimate likely eligibility. So to really couch this in a specific scenario, um, let's say that we have uh, Mary who lives with her husband, Mark, and they have three kids all under the age of five. And they also live with their mother-in-law who is 60 and she files her taxes separately. So right now they're all enrolled in WIC and Medicaid. So we would receive this data and we would want to try to assess, all right, uh, is this family likely eligible for FNS or not? So on the WIC side, um, the writing under those green boxes, this is just uh, fake data for the scenario. We would get this data coming in that says, okay, this is a family household size of six. They were certified this past summer in June and they reported an income of $800. Whereas in Medicaid, we see that they are on two separate, they're enrolled separately. So we've got the core family, enrolled on one case and then grandma on another because she files her taxes separately. So that's why we have um, a difference in the household sizes. And then because they certified for Medicaid a little later, you can see that they had a drop in their income. So they're making now $700. So we created data transfer transformation logic that ingests all these data points, assesses it, compares it, together to determine their eligibility for FNS. So based on this, um, because the WIC household size definition more aligns with the FNS household size um, uh, definition, we will prefer to use the WIC household size here when we're assessing for FNS eligibility. Um, so we will say this household has a household size of six. And then in terms of income, the hierarchy that we use here, since there are different incomes reported, we do it based on recency. So since they were certified more recently on Medicaid, we would use $700 and then assess their likely eligibility for FNS based on those data points. Okay, I hope everyone followed that. Um, so this next slide, this is a very high level overview of the data infrastructure, scalable data infrastructure that we built to ingest and process the data from these three programs. So the top part here in green above the dotted line, this shows the manual process that we first used to, um, to assess likely eligibility. And that took about 14 hours. And then we eventually automated this process and now it's down to under one hour. So we have we have a time savings of, of 13 hours, which is great. Um, so at a very high level, we ingest the three data sources 
on a monthly basis into our business intelligence data platform. This is where we have all of our data transformation logic um, based on you know, the bedrock of the cross enrollment matrix. And then from there, it updates our dashboards or Tableau dashboards on a monthly basis. And also from our data transformation logic, we're able to output outreach lists that we generate based on different parameters. And that's what's used for, um, that will be used for our outreach activities. And Madhu will be talking about that um, towards the end some more. So this, this solution took about one year to, to build. And the past six months or so, we've still been ironing, ironing things out because this, this work is very complicated. And it's not possible for us to think of every single scenario from the very beginning. Um, so there's a there's maintenance involved in this process, but it is scalable, and that's um, that's something that we've been really proud of and excited excited about. And I just want to chime in, Laurel, to just emphasize that you um, have done such a wonderful job of really engaging with our different business or program teams who are the subject matter experts on the policy and eligibility guidelines for each of these programs in many, many iterations. It has been like a going back and forth and really because it is so complicated and um, it has not been like a one and done, but definitely like many conversations to really make sure we got the matrix right, that we are building the dashboards in a way that's meaningful for end users. So I just want to give a lot of kudos, but also to help understand all the different players that were involved. Thanks, Manu. And this slide, this shows... Um an overview of the cross enrollment dashboards that we built. These are interactive dashboards on Tableau. They're internal, and these are shared with our business team, our cross enrollment business, business team, as well as senior leadership. And um, these are automated and updated on a monthly basis. And this helps the team as well to really understand where a lot of that opportunity is to, um, to increase enrollment, to reach out for cross enrollment for outreach efforts. All right, I will now pass it over to Madhu. Great. Um, I know we're coming close to time, so I'll just briefly talk about once we built all this infrastructure um, to know who is enrolled in, let's say, Medicaid or SNAP and likely eligible for WIC, meaning they are likely pregnant um, or um, have a child under five because we don't have really great data around postpartum. Um, for WIC, but we've identified, you know, folks who might be eligible for WIC, but not enrolled. And we wanted to test uh, the impact of text messaging to this population who we already know is enrolled in either Medicaid and or SNAP um, and send them. We tested a couple of different messages, one sample messages here um, at the bottom of the slide and worked uh, in a couple of different regions of our state, one that was more urban near Greensboro um, and another in the northeast part of our state that is uh, much more rural um, and Test. We are. We've wrapped up the pilot and are working with Duke University to evaluate the impact of sending text messages um, to this population to see if the outcome of um, WIC certification rates had increased as a result. So we're still finalizing all that data. So I don't have results to share yet, but um, definitely just even the process learnings along the way of you know, I know this is an evolving space of, of text messaging and, um, you know, whether it is effective, it's definitely a lower cost tool that states can use. Um, but we've, we've learned a lot even just about, you know, how, how, how we'll know whether people received our text messages and the different nuances of phone providers and whether they even provide you with that data. So, um, you know, while we're pulling all the results together, I think we've learned a lot just from an operational uh, standpoint of what, you know, what it takes to send text messages and, you know, what kind of, what even that data scrubbing process looks like. So um, more to come from North Carolina about, about that. Um, but we, you know, we're really excited that we could build the infrastructure to even do this and to to focus our efforts um, around we the reason we we started with this population was rather than just anybody who might be eligible for WIC, we thought 
Um, if they're already enrolled in Medicaid or, or SNAP, then they may be more open to um, participating in public benefits um, as opposed to if they were not in any program before. So I thought this was a group where there was opportunity to increase WIC enrollment. So um, I think we're close to the end of our slides. Oh, if you want to touch on this, Laurel. Yeah. Okay. So this is just one of the fruits, an example, one of the fruits of building the cross-enrollment data model. We were able to match that data, cross-enrollment data, with another one of our data sets, NC Care 360. And this is essentially our closed referral data, where we have a lot of people that are on NC Care 360 with um, food referrals. So one of the questions that the business has always had was, of those on NC Care 360 who've had a food referral, who is not on FNS? right? We weren't able to answer that before, but after we matched this data, we were able to identify who was not an FNS and also of those who, who's likely eligible. And so that was, that was a very big win for us because it's also a way for us to be able to prioritize our outreach efforts to those most in need. So I'll just wrap us up to say, you know, one of the biggest learnings I think that we had that I think you can hear from Laurel's part of the presentation was um, really just recognizing how complex this is um, and seeing how much variation there is in eligibility requirements across these major benefit programs that we know largely have a lot of overlap um, and are, are serving um, similar populations of folks in need, but there are still all these different um, nuances and areas that, that are not aligned and make it really complicated um, for us at the state to identify who who might be eligible for one uh, program and likely uh, eligible for another. But, um, you know, I, we always try to put our hats on thinking about the children and families and seniors that we're serving. And if it's this complicated for us to figure out, um, the families who are accessing our programs are facing this very same challenge in real time of trying to fill out their Medicaid application and, uh, you know, trying to define household composition in one way while applying for SNAP in the same agency, but it's a totally different model. So really, I think one of the learnings we have as a state and a call to action we have to our federal partners is particularly USDA and CMS. I think there's so much value that could come from aligning eligibility requirements across these major benefit programs that would make it easier for the families that we serve to, um, to not have to remember such different program requirements um, when really they're if they're needing help in one area, they're very likely to need help in another, um, whether it's healthcare or food. Um, and so I think you heard from Laurel that household composition is a great example of how it's so different from one program to another, but there are other data elements that are opportunities like